Surface water in the area can be threatened in different ways. The most common effect is from sediment runoff during rain. There have been tens of thousands of acres cleared over the last five years for gas production just in the Fayetteville Shale area. Even with decent sediment control in place, this still causes major problems in local creeks, streams, rivers, and lakes. This large amount of sediment piles up on the bottom of waterways and kills the eggs of fish and other animals. This sediment can be just as devastating as a chemical spill into a waterway, as studies by students at UCA show a decline in the population of invertebrates and other animals in our water. Another problem from the sediment is drinking water problems. Hundreds of thousands of people get their water from Gers Ferry Lake, some as far as Little Rock. I mentioned earlier the water problems that the city of Clinton and Heber Springs were having with their water that comes from the lake. It has gotten so bad in Clinton and the surrounding area that residents are in an uproar. The city is being forced to spend millions of dollars in tax money to upgrade its water treatment facility to be able to meet federal drinking water standards. We have interviewed people who have fished and scuba dove at the lake for many years and they tell us that the lake is murkier than they have ever seen it. Another way that surface water is affected is from released methane underground. This methane comes up through the water and can contaminate it, affecting fish and other animals. Many people have reported seeing a lot of bubbles coming up in streams, ponds, and other waterways after a well was fracked in the area. A third way that surface water can be harmed is from chemical and fluid spills. Trucks sometimes overturn in accidents and can spill their load into a ditch that runs into a waterway. Gas wells can also have blowouts after fracking, which is where the fluid starts to come back out of the hole rapidly and out of control. This happened in 2011 in Pennsylvania. A blowout preventer failed and fluid flowed from a well operated by Chesapeake for days before it was stopped. This caused devastation of a nearby waterway and contaminated water wells in the area. This has happened multiple times across the country and is similar to the BP oil spill in the Gulf except on a smaller scale. And it is flowback fluid that comes out of the hole, not oil. Here is a list of some of the threatened surface waters in the area. Gers Ferry Lake, the Little Red River, Brewer Lake, Cadron Creek, Lake Bennett, which is at Woolly Hollow State Park, Lake Overcup, and the tributaries to all of these along with smaller lakes and ponds in the area. Obviously, the most important surface water in the area that is threatened is Gers Ferry Lake. The lake is a drinking water source for hundreds of thousands of people all over central and north central Arkansas. People as far as Little Rock get their water from the lake. It's also a premier fishing lake for walleye and other fish, a popular boating and recreational lake for people from all over the country, and an economic hub of the area. The lake gets more annual visitors than the Grand Canyon. The Little Red River is also a very important surface water. It can be seen here in yellow with all of the wells surrounding it. The Little Red is a world-renowned trout fishing river and is also a major attraction to other fishermen and tourists. Brewer Lake is a popular fishing lake and drinking water source for Conway Corp, which provides water for most of the city of Conway and parts of Faulkner County. This lake also provides much of the water for Conway County. I will talk more about the wells near this lake in a moment. You can see Brewer Lake here at the bottom of the screen with Lake Overcup over here nearby. They are both relatively small and shallow lakes compared to Gers Ferry Lake. Sediment and spills near these lakes can have a much greater effect on water quality and wildlife than it would on a larger lake like Gers Ferry. This is a close-up of Brewer Lake. As you can see, the wells here, 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 and over here that are the closest wells to the lake. The lake can be seen here. Cadron Creek can be seen here in yellow. It is classified as an extraordinary resource water by the ADEQ and is a popular fishing, canoeing, and kayaking waterway. This creek is also a drinking water source for cattle all along this creek and a water source for agricultural farms along its route. It is the backup water source for the city of Conway for times when Brewer Lake becomes too low in times of drought. ADEQ had permitted a company to treat flowback fluid and then discharge it into the creek. However, the company recently gave up their permit and scrapped their plans to build the facility. They stated that a slowdown of production in the area due to low natural gas prices caused them to hold off on their plans. The company can reapply in the future if they so wish. While the company claims to be able to revert the water to drinking water standards, many have their doubts. The permit that ADEQ issued them would have allowed them to discharge water that was far from safe drinking water standards and would have allowed them to discharge up to 500,000 gallons of water per day into the creek. There is also another facility in the area that is already built and is already treating and recycling water to be reused for fracking. This facility is only permitted to reuse water and not to discharge it, but they recently applied for a permit to be able to discharge this water into another tributary that does flow into the Cadron Creek. Lake Bennett at Woolly Hollow State Park is also a popular fishing and swimming lake for the area. Two wells can be seen here just outside the park boundary upstream from the lake. Other waterways, like the three upper forks of the Little Red River, Choctaw Creek, Cypress Creek, Batesville Creek, 
and many other smaller creeks, streams, and lakes in the area are threatened by industry activity in the area. This is back to Brewer Lake. This is the location and permit number for the well that is closest to Brewer Lake, the drinking water source for most of the city of Conway and Conway County. This well had its share of controversy in the spring of 2001. After it was permitted and drilling started, ourselves and other similar groups in the state were alerted to its proximity to the lake by area residents. The well is located only 1,700 feet from the shoreline of Brewer Lake. It is also about 200 feet above the lake with steep slopes on all sides. A blowout or spill at this well location would flow quickly into the lake and could ruin the drinking water for almost 100,000 people. We notified the news stations, some of whom reported on the story. Conway Corp says that the companies drilling in the area are using best management practices. The USGS is monitoring water in Cypress Creek just before it runs into the lake for changes in sediment amounts or chemicals. They stated that in the summer of 2011 they were already seeing elevated amounts of sediment coming into the lake. The water supply from this lake may soon be having similar problems to those in Clinton and Heber Springs. The hole from this well actually went down and then curved under the lake. The horizontal section of the hole goes east from the well underneath the lake to a point on the other side of the lake. Efforts by area groups to stop the fracturing of this well failed, but months went by before the well was actually fracked. I wondered why it took so long to frack the well and I started investigating. I found out that in April of 2011, the company put a string of devices in the hole to measure the amount of gas in different parts of the hole before they fracture. This is common and tells the companies where the gas is most dense in the hole. These devices are called density logging tools. This device is radioactive. Two of these devices became stuck directly below Brewer Lake at about 7,000 feet deep. The company tried for multiple days but was unable to retrieve the devices. This information was never reported by the media and most people still don't know anything about it. I talked to the chief of the radiation control section at the Arkansas Health Department and asked him how much radiation is coming out of this device, is it anything to be concerned about? He paused for a moment and then replied, quote, well I guess if you're going to lose one of these things, that's about the best place you can lose one. After the company could not retrieve the device, they capped the top of the well with concrete, moved over a few feet, and then drilled another hole in the same area that was later fracked. Another device like this was lost in a hole in 2010 near Bald Knob. In this case, the device was lost at only about 3,500 feet deep. There are many misconceptions about how water is contaminated from fracking and other industry operations. As I explained earlier, chemicals being found in people's water is the least common type of water contamination. Most of the contamination complaints come from the drilling through the freshwater zone near the surface where people draw their water from, or from methane contamination from gas that is lost in the ground after fracking. There have been fracking chemicals found in well water around the country, including in Arkansas, but the industry maintains that all of these cases are due to surface spills or casing failure during fracking. This is how they get away with continuing to say that there have never been any cases of water contamination from fracking. This is simply untrue. They say that when done properly without failure, there is no possibility of water contamination from fracking from the injection zone deep underground. Companies often tout how they frack far below our water, but recently have been more careful to say that they are fracking below freshwater zones. This is because part of the exemption that the industry got in the 2005 Energy Policy Act is that companies can inject into an aquifer. As I mentioned before, Arkansas has one of the shallowest shale gas layers in the country. In the Fayetteville Shale area, most of the gas wells range from 1,200 feet deep to about 6,000 feet deep. Over half are less than 4,000 feet deep. The rock layers in the region form a large dome in southern Missouri and northern Arkansas, creating the Ozark Plateau. The formation of this plateau created many cracks and faults in the area, and the rock layers slope downward into the earth as you go from the northern end of the Fayetteville Shale to the southern end. On the northern end, the Fayetteville Shale outcrops in the Marshall area. Black layers of rock can be seen in the cliff faces that line Highway 65 in the area. This is the Fayetteville Shale. At the southern end of the area, the shale layer is about 9,000 feet deep and becomes vertical. This makes drilling and fracking virtually impossible on the southern end of the Fayetteville Shale. I was told by a geologist with the Geological Survey that he didn't expect drilling in the Fayetteville Shale area to occur any farther south than the south fork of the Cadron Creek because of the vertical nature of the rock layers. All of the rock layers are contained within multiple aquifer zones that are all part of the same larger aquifer system. These aquifers extend from the surface down to about 15,000 feet deep on the southern end of the Fayetteville Shale area. This is much deeper than the depth of the gas wells in the area. As I said earlier, the Fayetteville Shale layer is about 1,200 feet deep on the northern end of the area and about 9,000 feet deep on the southern end. This stratigraph shows that the Fayetteville Shale layer lies within the top layer of the aquifer system called the Western Plains Interior Confining System. This system extends from the surface down to about 1,500 feet on the northern end of the shale area 
and extends from the surface down to about 10,000 feet deep on the southern end of the shale area. Fracturing is occurring within this aquifer system. This map shows the area of this system, which obviously matches the shape of the Arcoma Basin, which contains the Fayetteville Shale. There is another aquifer directly below this system called the Springfield Aquifer seen here. It is about 500 feet thick. Then another major aquifer extends below the Springfield Aquifer called the Ozark Aquifer seen here. It extends to depths of up to 15,000 feet deep. There is another aquifer in western Arkansas called the Washita Mountains Aquifer where a few amount of gas wells have been fractured in this area. These aquifers all have different characteristics like differing amounts of porosity and permeability, which are terms for how much water the rock can hold within it and how quickly the water flows through the rock. All of these aquifers are interconnected, and as I mentioned earlier, many faults and cracks in the area are pathways to allow this fluid to migrate upwards much more quickly than in some of the other shale plays around the country. Here's a slide from a study done by the USGS in 1990 that describes this geologic formation in the area with all of the faults and cracks. Notice that the fourth bullet point says, these faults and fractures provide avenues for groundwater movement through virtually impermeable rock. We have confirmed all of this information through the Arkansas Geological Survey. They maintain that while fracking was occurring within our aquifers, that the water at the depths where fracking was occurring was saline and not fit for human use. However, they did confirm that this fluid migration upward over time was a possibility. There may not be widespread contamination right now from all this fluid that has been injected into our aquifers, but our fear is that two years from now, five years from now, ten or twenty years from now, this fluid will eventually make its way towards the surface and we will see widespread contamination of groundwater. A recent study in the Marcella Shale area in northeastern America did show that due to cracks and faults in the area, this fluid could migrate from deep underground up to the surface in a period as little as three years. And it did note that Arkansas would be even more susceptible to this as our shale layer is shallower and has more faults. There is also a large amount of natural forest land that has been leased for natural gas drilling. In 2005, a Reasonable Foreseeable Development Report, or RFD report, was prepared by the Bureau of Land Management regarding anticipated gas drilling in the forest. This report estimated that the number of gas wells to be drilled in our national forests in the following 10 years would be approximately 10 to 15 wells, which with accompanying roads, pipelines, and other disturbances would result in disturbances of acres of forest from 38 to 80 acres. The new RFD report prepared by the Bureau of Land Management dated 2008 estimated that 1,730 wells would be drilled and approximately 13,600 acres of disturbance within national forest land. A supplemental information report, or SIR, prepared in 2010 by the U.S. Forest Service determined that increasing the amount of wells by 100 times did not, quote, change any circumstances, information, or conditions with sufficient potential impact upon the environment of the national forest to justify or warrant the preparation of a correction, supplement, or revision to the revised land and resource management plan and the final environmental impact statement for the RLRMP that were approved in 2005. This means that they are saying that the new estimate of wells would not have enough of a different impact on the environment to warrant a new environmental impact statement or other reports. These two reports are required by law, and not filing them denied the public any new comment period and did not allow the public or any other state agency or official to object to the new plan. As of May of 2011, there were approximately 100 wells drilled or under development in the forest. In May of 2011, a lawsuit was filed after the BLM developed a new plan to lease additional wells in the Ozark St. Francis National Forest and underneath Greer's Ferry Lake. The plaintiffs alleged that the BLM and the U.S. Forest Service violated the law by not having conducted environmental impact statements and resource management plans for the forest as required by the Mineral Leasing Act, the National Forest Management Act, and the National Environmental Policy Act. The Forest Service and BLM failed to comply with the procedures for gathering information, public participation, and decision making set forth in numerous federal acts. The report and analysis were prepared without notice to the public and without public participation through public review and comment procedures required by many federal laws. The plaintiffs in this case were thereby deprived of a statutory due process right that is protected under the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments to the United States Constitution. A second similar lawsuit was filed in November of 2011 concerning the same details. In February of 2011, seismic testing was being done by Chesapeake. This was done in anticipation of drilling around and under the lake on BLM and Army Corps of Engineer land. The BLM has plans for approximately 700 gas wells around Gersferry Lake. 
These agencies also failed in this case to prepare an environmental impact statement or a resource management plan for the de development of oil, gas, and other minerals interests as required by law. The suit asks that the federal court not allow the Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, or the Corps of Engineers to lease any additional mineral holdings on federal proper property until environmental impact statements and resource management plans have been completed and approved, and that BLM be ordered to halt any activities being conducted by any persons under any gas leases already issued by it in Arkansas. There are many misconceptions about the process of fracking and other industry activities. The industry has spent hundreds of millions of dollars on television, radio, newspaper, and magazine ads to lead the public into thinking that this process is safe, among other things. Many larger companies have advertisements of their own, and many also come from the American Petroleum Institute, or API, and ANGA, America's Natural Gas Alliance. Here are some things that are often said but not true about the industry. The drilling occurs a mile or many thousands of feet below our groundwater with impermeable rock in between. We have shown this is not to be true in Arkansas. Here there are wells that are only 1,200 feet deep and over half are less than 4,000 feet deep. We have also shown that fracking actually occurs within an aquifer system and that many faults and cracks exist in the area through solid layers of rock. The next is fracking has been around for a long time or decades. While some form of fracking has been around for a long time, modern slick water high volume hydraulic fracturing has only been around for about a decade and has only been widely used in the U.S. over the last five years. The next, natural gas is cleaner than oil, coal, and gasoline. While natural gas is cleaner when burned, we have shown that when the emissions from the extraction process are considered, fracking for natural gas is more damaging to the atmosphere than carbon emissions, and this doesn't take into consideration environmental impacts to land and water. Another is natural gas is reducing our dependence on foreign oil. In 2010, only about 1% of all of the natural gas used in this country was used in vehicles. The rest was used for electricity generation and for use in homes and businesses for heat, hot water, and cooking. Also, dozens of permits have been issued over the last few years for companies to build natural gas export terminals on the East Coast, Gulf Coast, and the West Coast. In the near future, a very large amount of this gas will be shipped overseas, where natural gas prices are three to four times in Asia and Europe than what they are in America. This gas may be reducing our need for coal, but not foreign oil. And when all the amount of gasoline and diesel fuel is considered that is needed to transport the trucks in the process, we actually may be increasing our dependence on foreign oil with this industry. The next is that there has never been proven water contamination from fracking. There has never been solid proof of contamination from fluid migrating upward through the ground. However, this is difficult to prove, and there have been many cases of casing failure either during or after fracking. There have also been many confirmed cases of methane contamination after fracking. Many spills and blowouts have caused surface water contamination as well as groundwater contamination. Drilling and even seismic testing can also contaminate groundwater with harmful substances that are already in the ground. Since companies were only recently required to reveal part of their chemicals they use, it was previously impossible to tie water contamination to a company even if chemicals were found. Until current studies were started by the EPA, it was up to the landowner to pay for very expensive testing to hire lawyers and experts to go up against the most powerful and wealthy industry in the world. Another misconception is those who have complained have not profited from the industry and are jealous. I hear this a lot and it's laughable. This is simply not true. Many in our organization and many we have talked to with problems have leased wells and have made money from the industry. And whether you have profited or not, you have every right to complain when you are negatively affected. The next is Arkansas's regulations are proper and stricter than in other states. Some of our laws are stricter than other states, but many are not. No state's laws are adequate as this industry and technique have only recently exploded across the country and federal regulation has recently been turned over to the states. Most states have struggled to catch up with the new regulations and proper inspections. The next this industry has saved Arkansas from the impacts of the recession and most of the jobs go to Arkansans. While the economic benefit has helped the area, it has had little effect on the rest of the state. Many of the jobs have gone to workers who have moved here from states like Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. The amount of jobs, tax income, and overall economic benefits have failed to reach anywhere close to the estimates in a study done by the University of Arkansas in 2008. Also, companies put up bonds before operations to cover anything that may need to be done to the well if the company goes bankrupt and the state must plug the well or clean up contamination. Arkansas's bond amounts are low and sometimes the state has to pay large amounts of money to fix these things. 
Arkansas taxpayers from all over the state are already going to pay a large amount of tax money to fix the roads in the area. This is why passing the severance tax increase is so important. Future bankruptcies by companies can cost the taxpayer much more money as well. Another misconception, the industry will be here for 30 to 40 years and the U.S. has enough shale gas to last us 100 years. Recently, the USGS and the Energy Information Administration released new estimates on the amount of recoverable gas in the Marcellus Shale, which is the largest shale play in America. These estimates were 40 to 80 percent lower than their previous estimates. There may be 100 years worth of gas in the ground in America, but not all of it is recoverable. This 100 year estimate assumes that our current rate of use stays the same for the next 100 years. It also assumes that none of the gas will be sold overseas, as much of it will, and it also assumes that all of the areas in America would be available for drilling, including under lakes, in cities and towns, in parks, in protected areas and wildlife refuges, and off the west and east coasts of the United States. What we are actually probably looking at is a decade or two of natural gas supply that can be reasonably extracted. Multiple studies by professional investment firms show that the Fayetteville shale gas production has already peaked. We estimate that at the current pace, most of the drilling and fracking will be done in five to ten years, leaving all of the industry employees jobless after they were led to believe that they would be able to work until retirement in the industry. Another misconception is that gas royalties will make you rich. A very small percent of people have made lots of money from gas royalties. The amount of money you get depends on the amount of land you have. People with hundreds of acres and multiple wells may get a large amount of money, but most get mediocre or small amounts. Most of the well's production occurs within the first year or two that the well is in production. People report getting a decent signing bonus up front, and then royalty checks quickly dwindle. For example, we interviewed a family with a good-sized farm that got an initial check for $19,000 for their gas lease. They paid off some loans, went on a trip, and quickly the money was used. Then they started getting royalty checks every month for almost $1,000. The checks quickly got smaller and smaller until just a year after the well was fracked, they were getting a check for $29 every month. The last misconception on our list is we need to drill more to lower gasoline prices. I won't get into the complex world system that controls gasoline prices. It is one of the few commodities that doesn't always follow the simple supply and demand theory. Global politics and Wall Street speculators have a large impact on gasoline prices. Even if we produce our own oil and gas, Gasoline prices are still set based on global factors. Some in the government say we should be exploiting our oil and gas reserves. We contend that we are already doing so. If what we are doing now with fracking, drilling on federal lands, and deep sea offshore drilling is not exploiting our resources, then I don't want to know what exploiting them would be like. The federal government and President Obama have done very little at all to slow down domestic oil and gas production. And actually, America is producing more oil than they have in the last 13 years and is importing less oil than they have in the last eight years. America has been experiencing a fracking boom across the U.S. for over three years now, and the more oil and gas we produce, the higher gasoline prices rise. Dozens of new pipelines have been permitted across America in the last three years. In de December of 2011, the United States had 2,008 drilling rigs exploring for oil and natural gas when there were only 1,018 rigs in the whole rest of the world. This information is according to Baker Hughes who keeps up with drilling rigs across the world. America is already drilling and extracting as fast as these companies can get it out of the ground. Opening even more protected and federal lands to oil and gas exploration and permitting one controversial pipeline is not going to solve our energy crisis. We must aggressively start pursuing renewable energy for electricity production to replace coal and natural gas, and we must start developing renewable biofuels, battery technology, and increased engine efficiency to eliminate our dependence on foreign and domestic oil and gasoline. So, in the end, to summarize everything, most of our state agencies have clear conflicts of interest with the oil and gas industry. All of the legislators from the Fayetteville Shale area are on a caucus formed to protect the industry. We do not have the proper regulations in place to protect our environment and more importantly the health of the people in the area. We do not have the proper manpower to keep up with inspecting the industry. Companies are allowed by law to take minerals against people's will and allowed to take property against people's will. Companies are permitted to put a well only 200 feet from homes. There are many different ways that this activity causes water contamination from seismic testing to drilling to fracturing to fluid transport and disposal. The fracturing where chemicals are injected is occurring as shallow as 1,200 feet and into the middle of aquifers. The area is littered with faults through layers of rock. 
New studies with computer models showed that this fluid can migrate in a very short period of time into water near the surface. Companies are only required to disclose a partial list of the chemicals they use, but many are known to cause cancer and other diseases. Some are harmful in extremely low quantities. There are many new sand mines and chemical plants across the state. There are noise and light issues associated with this activity. There is a large amount of road damage. There are issues with how this fluid is disposed of on roads, in fields, and in disposal injection wells that cause earthquakes. There are no regulations to control toxic emissions from well sites and compressor stations. These emissions have been shown to be very high in other shale plays and are causing many health problems for people in the area. The Department of Environmental Quality has also told us that they do not have the proper equipment to monitor air quality in the area. There are now thousands of new pipelines that are capable of exploding or leaking in the area. There are many nuisance problems associated with the industry along with litter. There are many complaints of dangerous truck drivers. Many people from outside the Fayetteville Shale area get their water and some of their food from within the Shale area. The economic hubs of this area are tourism and farming, both of which are greatly affected by the natural gas industry. There is an overinflated amount of jobs and revenue from the industry. Many of the jobs go to out-of-state employees from Oklahoma, Texas, and Louisiana. There is a higher crime rate and accident rate in the area. The death rate among industry employees is seven times the national average. Tax money is being used to pay for natural gas filling stations and natural gas vehicle conversions, which are mostly being used by natural gas companies. The large amount of diesel and gasoline used to extract this natural gas is probably actually increasing our dependence on foreign oil faster than the natural gas is reducing that dependence. Over a dozen new permits have been issued since 2009 for companies to build natural gas export terminals on the east, west, and gulf coasts to ship this gas to Europe and Asia. Companies pay for very misleading advertisements about the industry. Those who speak out against the industry are ridiculed and stereotyped as jealous, tree-hugging, environmental extremists by many who support the industry. And I'm sure I left a few things out. All of the information I have given here is backed up with sources on our website, ArkansasFracking.org. If you have any questions, please email us at ArkansasFracking at gmail.com. It is time to take this information and stand up for your friends, relatives, and neighbors who have been negatively affected by this industry. We need jobs, and nobody wants to see anyone get laid off or lose their job, but we can't allow what's happening to continue for the sake of jobs or for any other reason. It's time to quit ignoring the problems and stop this activity until we have the proper studies, until we have the proper regulations and manpower to regulate the industry, and until this fracking is not occurring in aquifers. Please join us in support of a temporary moratorium and better regulation for hydraulic fracturing in Arkansas. Again, my name is Sam Lane. I'm the director of ArkansasFracking.org, and I'm running for state representative in District 67 against Shell Caucus member Stephen Meeks. If you would like more information about myself and my campaign, you can visit my campaign website at samlane4u.com. Thank you again for your time, and have a good day.